Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Uh, I'm glad we're starting almost on time. Today is the two years almost to the day that the chancellor was confirmed by the council uh, to be the chancellor of the school system, although she'd been on the job since no the November the prior year when Michelle Reed decided that she and the mayor-elect Vincent Gray couldn't possibly work together. And I think, and so they wanted to move on. And so they, had, they uh, agreed, the mayor Fenty, outgoing mayor and the incoming mayor and Reed and everyone agreed that Kaya Henderson would be the interim chancellor. And uh, she's a native of Mount Vernon, New York, which if you don't know where that is, it's basically a th stone's throw from the Bronx. She was born in July of 1970. That was the year I got married. <laughs> so it, it irritates me that she's what, like 43? I will be 43. 43 July 1st. The week after, yeah. Very good, happy birthday. Thank anyway, you. <laughs> she graduated from high school with honors, shock of shocks. And she, her mother was Kathleen Henderson, who was a educator and a single mother, which is important for the conversation, who was a principal her mother was a principal by the time her mother was 30 years old. Chancellor Henderson has a bachelor's degree in international relations from Georgetown School of Foreign Service and a Master of Arts in Leadership also from Georgetown. She began her career teaching Spanish in a South Bronx middle school and she later joined and became executive director of Teach for America. In 2000, Ms. Henderson began her work, am I doing all right? Yeah, so far so good. I've left out the good stuff for later. In 2000, Ms. Henderson began to work with the New Teacher Project, where she became the vice president. And she came to the school system here, as you all sure you know, as deputy chancellor in 2007 to work with Michelle Ree. And the rest is history being written. So thank you very much tonight. Let's welcome Kaya Henderson. Bill Turk is a reporter for the Washington Post who used to cover the school system when you were the deputy and now covers Montgomery County politics. I don't know what he did wrong at the Post. But he, talked to, he told me when I asked him what questions I should ask, he, he said, well, you know, the chancellor works really long hours, early morning, late nights. This is one of them. And he says, the first question should be, Madam Chancellor, do you still have the can of Red Bull in your desk? that you take at five o'clock every night? We have a small refrigerator in my office. It is full of, I'm sorry, we do have a small refrigerator in my office. It is full of Red Bulls, Diet Cokes, and green tea, Diet Green Tea, and water. Um, so No Red Bull? It is full, a Red Bull was the first thing I said, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I heard green tea and it made me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm still on the stuff. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions, but I'm just thinking, would you like to just, like a candidate forum, just take one minute to welcome everyone and thank them for coming? Sure. Um, and that'll be the end of the polite segment. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I would like to say I'm very happy to be here. I'm, I'm a former resident of Capitol Hill. I lived on 12th between Constitution and C for four years um, and loved it. Um, when I went to buy a house, I just couldn't afford it. Um, and so <laughs> I ended up in Brookland, which I love and where I've been for 12 years. Um, I have two, I have a, an amazing partner and two fantastic kids who are in DC public schools. And so um, I am not just the, um, I'm not just um, the leader of DC public schools, I'm a client, I'm a stakeholder. And I fundamentally believe that um, in the nation's capital, we should have an excellent educational system. And I think we can build it. Um, lots of challenges, but um, we have great folks and um, great folks within DCPS, great folks within the community. I feel like there is momentum um, around this work. And so I feel really lucky to have the job that I have and I really enjoy it. So um, I'm excited to share a little bit today with you all. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You were appointed by the, uh, by the incoming mayor, Mayor Gray, who agreed to your interim appointment. He took months, months, months to actually appoint you as a chancellor. And, we, and of course, I announced it three times on Channel 4 that you were being appointed. And I was just, I wasn't wrong, I was just early. You were early. Um, 
You knew something we didn't know. <laughs> Nate, that's, well, I like sources. Nate Saunders, the teachers' union president at the time, objected strenuously. He worried that you weren't going to go to alter any of the Michelle Reed programs that you had been part and parcel of for the last three years as a deputy. But National Education Secretary Arne Duncan had a different view. As soon as he heard that Michelle Reed was not going to stay, he called the mayor and said, Let's put Kaya in there. He, he said that he, you had proven your worth in negotiating the union contracts and all of that. Michelle Ree had just constant turmoil around her while she was uh, doing her job. You came into a volatile situation. How did you calm things down, or did you? And you're just doing it differently. Um, I don't know that I necessarily calm things down, but I do think that Michelle and I have very different um, styles. We have different ways of approaching the work. Um, Can I interpret that? She, Michelle Ree was brusque, bruised feelings, and wanted to get things done and then worry about the bruised feelings later. And you actually smile when you do something tough. All right, go ahead. Uh, may <laughs> So here, I, I want to be fair, um, and, and you know, for those of you that don't know, um, Michelle has been a good friend since 1992. We started teaching for America together back in 92. Um, in 2000, I went to the New Teacher Project, which was the consulting firm that she founded, um, and we worked together for 10 years or so before we came to DC Public Schools. So um, we have a very complementary relationship, things that I'm strong at. Um, are different than the things that she's strong at. And I, I actually think people say to me all the time, well, you know, whew, you know, you're so much better than Michelle. What I've come in terms of style and how you deal with people, um, I think what I've come to recognize is that organizations need different things, different types of leaders at different times. And I think that um, we, we, you know, DCPS really needed um, some, some shaking up. Um, and I think that Michelle's style, Michelle's sense of urgency, um, coupled with Mayor Fenty's approach, um, called for one set of, of uh, an operating style. Um, and to be frank, I think I'm only able to, um, to operate the way I want to operate in part because a lot of the hard stuff, um, a lot of the difficult conversations have been opened up. You can't applaud. This is not a candidate forum, so you can't applaud. That's good. And also, if you didn't turn off your cell phone, it's okay because when it rings, I will answer it. <laughs> and we'll put it on speakerphone and then see what people are saying when they call you. All right. Tomorrow, Mayor Gray, press release here, is scheduled to give an education address at 2 o'clock in Anacostia. Can you give us a hint of what he's going to say? Sure. Um, you know, part of the, when we went through the school consolidation um, process, we did community meetings in every ward. Um, I took meetings with every group, every parent, everybody who wanted to talk about the proposal that we put on the table. And one of the resounding things that we heard from the community was, what is the vision? Like, we've got this rapidly expanding charter sector. You're closing neighborhood schools. Like, what do we believe about neighborhood schools versus charters? How does this all work together? Um, people knew that the boundary and feeder pattern work was kind of um, coming soon. And so we heard the community sort of saying, paint us a picture for how this works together. What's your educational vision? And the mayor did commit at the time to um, work through the spring and over the summer to advance an, education vi an educational vision that um, brings some coherence to the different systems that we have. And so um, that's what the that's what the speech is about. He did say that he would, by the end of the school year or early summer, um, put some things together with the addition of um, Abigail Smith, who's the new deputy mayor for education, um, who's fantastic and has been a real um, convener and has, I think, the charter school sector and DCPS working um, in tandem in ways that we never have before. Um, she's been able to help really clarify his vision, and so he's going to talk about it. Uh, the mayor didn't do so well in this election, in this uh, uh, Ward 6 when he got elected, but he said in a recent speech that 
that the district has some of the most aggressive school reform agendas in the nation, but I want to see more gains and I want to see them faster. That's true. Well, I mean, I think everybody wants to see more gains and everybody wants to see them faster, right? But if it was that easy, right, everybody would be doing it. Every school district in the country is struggling with how we close the achievement gap, how we prepare our students for a more rigorous curriculum that is um, the common core state standards, right? This is for 40 years, DCPS was on a decline. And so I think we have to adjust our expectations around how quickly we'll see results given that we literally had to rebuild the system from the bottom up, from rethinking the human capital, the people who are in our buildings, um, to rethinking the systems and how we use data and information um, to, you know, one, just getting the operation to function, but then building on that foundation to really change what's happening in the classrooms around teaching and learning. Really, um, two years ago when I came on as chancellor, we didn't have a standardized curriculum across the district. Different people were doing different things. Um, and we worked really hard to uh, lay out a three-year academic plan, which we are finishing year two and now moving into year three, to standardize curriculum. So our teachers now finally have um, the tools and the resources that they need. We've aligned professional development. We are actually purchasing materials. We hadn't had a textbook adoption since we oh, sorry, what's a textbook we adoption? Purchased new textbooks. Okay. Um, I don't know all the bureaucratic sorry. language. <laughs> okay, um, bought, bought textbooks. Yes, we we <laughs> bought textbooks. We. <laughs> okay. um, bought computers. We have. I only know English and Southern <laughs> English at that, so it's kind of. Okay, good. Well, thank you. We're going to get to some of the nuts and bolts of school reform, but there is some news today. Um, you had. You had a meeting scheduled with David Catania, the aggressive new chairman of the new Council Education Committee. And you didn't go, and you didn't go because the mayor asked you not to go. I spoke with the mayor's office, and Pedro uh, Ribeiro, the press secretary, confirmed to me that the mayor asked you not to go. There is some concern that with David Catania, who's proposed a, a bunch of reforms, which we'll get into in a moment, that. Maybe there's the aggressiveness of the mayor, the aggressiveness of David Catania, that you, the chancellor, are caught in the middle and that maybe this is gonna affect school reform. Can you talk about, you've had conferences with the chairman Catania, you've had breakfast with him, but, you, <laughs> but he was, I would just say irritated for the camera sure. that you had canceled today's meeting. Yes. And, what is the situation between you, the mayor, and David Catania, whose intent, he says, on making some changes? Well, um, you know, first of all, the mayor is my boss. And so I have to, you know, whatever he directs me to do, I need to do. Um, I think that, but I don't think that what the mayor is, I think the mayor is being reasonable. The mayor and council member Catania have not sat down since council member Catania became the chair of the education committee. And I think as some of the events are unfolding, um, it's really time for them to have a conversation. And in and, fact- and You may not know they're gonna to meet tomorrow. Yes, I do know oh, that. You're about well, to, you were about fact, to now say, go ahead. Well, no, no, I wasn't. But the, the mayor simply asked me, he didn't ask me not to meet with Mr. Catania. He asked me to meet with Mr. Catania after their meeting so that they could get on the same page or whatever. And then, um, and then we could meet because in part, I think, um, you know, it's very easy. I'm a very recognizable figure. I'm responsible for a significant number of kids in the city, but not all kids. And I think lots of times people substitute me as the education official, right? But the mayor has actually been very um, intentional about bringing charters into the conversation because almost 40% of our kids are in charter schools. And so what the mayor is saying is, in fact, it's not just about the DCPS, it's not just about the chancellor, um, it is about a portfolio of schools that includes both DCPS and charters. And I've charged my deputy mayor to kind of pull all of this together. And so I think people sometimes substitute, you know, my, my leadership of DCPS, my visibility, with the mayor's total agenda, and I only represent part of the mayor's agenda. When David Catania announced his seven-part reform plan that he wanted to do, 
Um, your public comments at the time were less than enthusiastic, more like you needed to know more about them, whether to support them, without getting to the details of the seven plans. Did, do you feel like David Catania is consulting with you enough? So, you know, I, I think we are, we're lucky to have so much focus and intention on education, right? Um, what is Anybody difficult? want to interpret that answer? <laughs> no, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Um, what's difficult is that lots of different people have different ways to get there, right? And so um, for me, my job is, is to try to figure out um, what I think is the best way to get there. Um, relying on the expertise that I have as an educator, but also to ensure that I've engaged various stakeholders and incorporated their ideas. Um, I think the challenge around the Catania legislation, and, and you know, David and I share a lot of, of, um, of, of common ideas about what needs to happen in DC public schools, um, but the process, I, I guess, um, the process was not one where we said, here's a problem that we're gonna try to solve, right? So let's discuss how we're going to solve it. Um, he had some ideas that he asked for some initial reaction to, but not in a complete and total context. And so I didn't feel comfortable saying, yes, I support this, or no, I don't support this, because literally the first time that I saw the whole package of information was when it came out publicly. Um, and so, you know, I, I actually feel like we, we We'll, we'll need to sit down, um, and the meeting today was supposed to be the beginning of that, but I respect the mayor's desire to you know, make the first step in that. Um, but we'll sit down and we'll figure out how to make the legislation right. We have a, we, you know, on the Attendance Accountability Act, which was one of the first things that Mr. Catania advanced, um, you know, there was lots of negative response to that. We don't wanna put parents in jail. And Mr. Catania was great about you know, we came and said, look, these are the things that we don't like about it. Here are some different ideas that we can pursue. And we all came to a good, um, a good solution and we passed it and the executive supports it and the council supports it. So I think that um, we just gotta get back to sitting down and doing the work together. Um, and I think we'll end up in the right place. Although our mayor uh, election is, the primary is April Fool's Day next year. That was a mistake by the council, incidentally. It wasn't supposed to be on April Fool's Day, but it's going to be. There are three council members who are running for mayor now. Mr. Catania has not discouraged speculation that he'll run in the fall, particularly and especially if Mayor Gray wins renomination in April. With the contentiousness of politics of three council members, you try to stay out of politics, but how does that complicate your job? Um, it complicates my job, for sure. It's like a Rubik's uh, <laughs> Cube of who means what to whom. Yeah, you know, one of the reasons why I was reluctant to take this role is because I really like doing the work. I like digging down into the actual like content of teaching and learning, um, of running an organization. And part of being the chancellor of DC Public Schools means being very political, being very external. Um, and. Um, and so it is challenging because, um, again, I actually feel like everybody wants to do right by schools, but everybody has a different way of getting there. And everybody wants to be the driver and the architect of the way we get there. Um, and so, you know, I try to keep my head down and <laughs> keep running the schools. Um, there's an African proverb that says, when the elephants fight, it's the grass that gets trampled. And I feel like our children in our schools are the grass. And my, I'm a grass tender, right? That's my job. The, Mr. Catania on the Kojo Nnamdi Politics Hour last week called you an excellent chancellor. But he wouldn't go so far as to say what he thought about the mayor. And so I just think, I, just, I bring that up because I think it's really important going forward in the politics of the city. No matter what you think of what Kaya Henderson is doing, whether she's as aggressive as, as the Michelle Ree or whether she should do less or do more or do something different. The mayoral politics is going to hover over the school system sure. and invade it as we go forward. So I think it's real important. The city has stopped this, the enrollment slide. There are more uh, people enrolling in the schools. Um, but you, you closed 15 schools for the end of this school year. You survived a court challenge to that. 
Um, are we done with school closings? I hope so. I really do. Um, let me tell you who would like to not do any more school closings ever in my life. Um, I, I really do hope so. Um, I think that, you know, it's been no secret. I, I've been working in or with DC Public Schools since 1997. Um, and as far back as the late 90s, there were plans around school closings and they're contentious and lots of folks don't want to do it. I mean, we just didn't, if we had kept pace um, in terms of shrinking our inventory um, as we lost students, then we wouldn't have to do these big rounds of, of closings. Um, but um, I actually believe that we've closed schools without um, investing appropriately to make them more attractive on the other side. And so we're really trying to do that. Um, we're really trying to create options that families want. We're trying to expand options um, that have been successful. Um, after the 2008 closures, um, we, um, that's where we hatched the idea for the Capitol Hill Montessori School, right? And in just a couple of years, that has grown from, you know, no Montessori school or just a Montessori program in the cluster to a full out elementary school, which we're now expanding to a K to eight. Um, and it's full to the gills. And so um, I think we, um, we have an opportunity to scale things that are working to create new opportunities. And so my hope is that we will not close any more schools. You're that, on. At least I won't. <laughs> uh, Council Member Wells, who represents this uh, ward and running for mayor, has said that he would like to see an elementary school in every part of the city where parents or guardians may walk their children to school. Is that possible? I think yes. I think yes. But I, I also think that um, if we just rely on DCPS schools, um, we can get there, but we have a broader set of schools in the mix. And there are charter schools that want to serve neighborhood kids and want to be that livable, walkable solution too. And so we've got to figure out how to incorporate them. I'm sorry, I have to point out, she just said livable and walkable. I, you know, come on, I'm in Ward 6, right? That's the politics of knowing what to do as the chancellor. <laughs> Take the Ward 6 council member who's running for mayor, his slogan, living, although he now says livable, walkable, and affordable. Amen. So you have to, so I, you, I gotta so you better update your, uh, <laughs> your uh, But there are some school buildings that have, and on Capitol Hill, I was at one with Kojo not long ago. It's, it's a former school that's a luxury building where mm -hmm. people are living. There's, I live in Southwest Washington where a former school is the first district police headquarters. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's another school in, on M Street where people are talking about reopening it. Uh, do we have excess buildings? Are we going to be in trouble that we need more school buildings and they've been given away? I want to get to charters separately. Yep. So, are, are we losing our stock? Yep. So this was very important to me in this round of closures because if you look at the population trend, um, we are due in the next five to ten years to see a huge population burst. Um, over a third of the city's residents right now are under 35. Many of them are young families, and um, we're going to have a lot more public school age children um, around 2020, a ton. And so what we need to do is have an accordion-like system where when we have fewer children, we can decrease the number of buildings. But as we see population start, starting to rise, and we now have data which show us in which neighborhoods that will happen, that we can then reopen. And so with the buildings, um, what we've done, for the most part, it works one of two ways. DCPS can surplus a building, which says, I don't need it for 25 years, right? or DCPS can, um, can actually lease a building for a short term, a medium term, or a long term. And previously, we had been encouraged or whatever to just surplus all of these buildings when in fact, um, we will need this inventory. And so we've worked with the deputy mayor's office to kind of scope out which school buildings are further off um, from seeing huge population um, growth so that we can enter into kind of longer term leases with those buildings, um, but then really designating other buildings for short term leases 
um, so that we can reopen. Van Ness on M Street and Southwest is a great example. We closed Van Ness in 2008 because um, there weren't enough children in the neighborhood, but we, we knew from the city's planning department that condos and apartment buildings and homes were going up and that by 2014 or 2015 we would actually have enough children to sustain an elementary school and so what we did with that building is we use it for administrative purposes right now and we will actually begin working with the community this fall um, to put together a reopening plan for Van Ness so um, you know we've got to be able to shrink when we need to but expand when we need to It'd be nice. To, <clears throat> it would be nice if you all take the bars off those windows too. It's like a prison. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I'll tell you, um, aesthetics is really important, and in the modernizations that um, we've done, the architects and planners have done a really nice job of trying to not make these places look like some of the prisons that they currently look like, look like. Um, but one of the things that has been really difficult for us um, is. We, you know, now we have a ton of technology in our buildings and um, people break in. I have schools that repeatedly, and, and the alarms are on and there's funky, you know, whatever, these mesh windows that you're not supposed to be able to get into. Um, but computers are a hot commodity and we're seeing a ton of robberies and so uh, we've got to figure out a pretty way to keep our, our inventory safe. The, the city since Mayor Williams and uh, through Tony, um, through Fenty and uh, even current mayor, there's been a great deal of physical improvements of all the schools. The new high schools are remarkable for anyone who hasn't been to them. But, there's, but truancy is a problem. Um, U.S. Attorney Ronald Machen spoke to the Federal City Council yesterday in a, in a private speech that wasn't supposed to be public. But said but you're that, making but it I, public. Yes, well, Unfortunately, he didn't say anything really controversial, but he did say something seriously about truant, and, which would have made it much better news if it were. <laughs> but he said truancy is a huge problem. The ninth grade is where children stop going to school. They drop out, and it causes problems in juvenile delinquency and adult criminal activity and just wasted lives. Um, Mr. Catania has complained that the mayor's new budget has only like a million dollars for new truancy efforts. What can you do? with the new schools that are better physically and with the teachers that you've tried to bring in and the principals you've brought in to do more to get the students into the schools. Yeah, um, so a couple things. First of all, um, Mr. Machen is absolutely right. Ninth grade is a critical year. Um, if children are not successful in passing English one and algebra one, their chances of finishing high school are slim to none. When you look at some of our young people who have been failed at the elementary and middle school level, when they get to high school, they don't have a, a snowball's chance of passing Algebra I or, or English I, and so um, they fail, um, in part because we just throw them all in, all ninth graders, on-track folks, struggling folks, we throw them all in. Teachers are trying to teach to lots of different levels at the same time. We haven't provided them with the interventions and resources that they need. And so you get this class of folks. I mean, our biggest, the, our largest truant group are ninth grade repeaters. So these are people who are um, repeating the ninth grade for the second or third time. Imagine being a 16 year old in the ninth grade. Um, and what we have not done is, one, we have not been thoughtful about how we, again, kind of segment folks um, so that we can meet their needs in different ways. We haven't been thoughtful about how we um, move kids who just can't be successful in a regular school setting into an alternative setting. Um, and so, um, what we, you know, some of the best research around high schools out there says that um, a strategy called Ninth Grade Academies um, is really a game changer. We've seen it in Chicago and Boston and a few other places where effectively you build a cocoon around a smaller group of young people in the ninth grade. They have a team of teachers who are dedicated to them. They also have a social worker or a psychologist or a counselor. We actually have community resources through um, the Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services to provide some of the wraparound supports, right? Um, but you're able to group young people so that your kids who are on track to, gra to completing the ninth grade successfully, they're working with a group of teachers who can move them, accelerate them. Your kids who are struggling have a longer school day, a longer school year, and a team that is working with 
you know, reading interventions and math interventions and, you know, advisory or character development stuff so that you can begin to get them on track. And, and, and I want to be clear that whatever group you're in, you don't stay in, right? You just stay there for as long as you need that level of intervention. Um, a third group might need more intensive um, intervention or might need to come out of the school and go to an alternative program. Um, and so we have, for a long time, we have what we call stay schools. You might know, you think of night schools, right? It's probably something that you're familiar with. Um, we have actually kind of mm, stopped paying attention to our alternative schools, and we actually serve more adults in our alternative schools um, who have not completed diplomas than young people who are off track. Um, we're totally re-examining that, because if you're 16 in the ninth grade, you need a fresh start. You need a different place to be. Um, I, I did my last graduation today, and it was by far one of the most inspirational. Um, it was Luke Seymour and Washington Metropolitan High School, two alternative high schools, and these are kids who who um, have faced all kinds of challenges. These are the kids who've been truant for, you know, significant parts of the school year or years and years, or they've been incarcerated, or they, um, you know, ha are parents or whatever they are facing. And um, we actually graduated more children from just one, Luke C. Moore, um, than all of our neighborhood high schools except for Columbia Heights Education Campus. Why? Because we're able to surround these young people with the supports and interventions that they need. These young people are overcoming amazing things. They want a high school diploma. They want to be able to read. They want to be able to do math. They want to go on to college. And many of them are because we've been able to create the right environment for them to succeed. And we just have to do that systemically. Vocational school and uh, people who are not college oriented. I mean, I still have on my wall at home my uh, seventh grade report card. Can do better. <laughs> Needs improvement. And I hated the academic world. But it seems there's been a, a few fledgling efforts to attract students' attention to something more work oriented, industry, industry oriented rather than college preparatory schools. And what about, some have suggested, why not have a summer jobs program four quarters a year? Mm -hmm. and let people, students work in the schools, do different types of things to make them more invested rather than just being told they should do better. Yes, um, absolutely right. So we've actually been working with, and I think um, the state superintendent, the interim state superintendent is announcing this maybe Friday or Monday, sometime in the next few days. Um, we've, she doesn't upstage the mayor. We, uh, I let, yes. Uh, <laughs> see, I don't like to get into the politics. Um, uh, we've worked with a, uh, a working group, um, a citywide working group, um, with the public charter schools, DC public schools, um, the state superintendent's office, the workforce investment councils, which are industry councils, um, to help rethink our citywide approach to career and technical education. And, and we've come up with a really nice plan that will effectively restart career and technical education in DC, writ large, and um, they're announcing that plan in the next few days, so I won't. Is Phelps, um is that the Fel is Phelps? That is, Phelps is. That was a great school. It has the Phelps. I believe that's the school where you go into it and all the wiring and the pipes are exposed so the students can learn the technical, electrical, plumbing, uh, construction. Yep. So Phelps is architecture, is that construction, still doing well? and engineering. It's doing well. I was at their graduation yesterday. Um, and their kids are going on to college and going on to careers and doing amazing things. At Cardozo, we have a construction trades academy and a transportation technology academy. But in fact, we will reopen Spingarn. Uh, we're closing Spingarn to redo it as a career and technical education center um, focused on transportation and information technology. And what we're trying to do is um, look at the economic opportunities, where jobs are across the city and where jobs are coming, um, and try to prepare our young people for those jobs. So for example, um, WMATA has 600 bus driver jobs that go vacant every year. Bus drivers make anywhere from 60 to $80,000 a year, and that's a good job. And so we should teach our young people who, how to drive buses because um, the, the bar that I set for our career and technical education programs is, I want you to be able to come out and support a family of four on what you're making, right? Um, previously, our, our programs have prepared you for kind 
kind of entry level jobs where you make $8 an hour. Well, our young people are facing real economic pressures. And so we've got to be able to put them in a different situation. Um, and if it means year round, it means year round. The streetcar line is coming on um, Benning Road and H Street. And so um, Spingarn is an ideal place. There'll be um, all different kinds of jobs created through that industry. And so we want to take advantage of it. And the US Department of Transportation has said to us, we'll partner with you because there are tons of transportation industry jobs that go unfilled. Uh, I've saved this. I want to get the audience questions. If there are some, please bring them up. Um, if you have one, just wave it quietly. Um, one of the biggest issues, school closings, school uh, curriculum, one of the biggest issues coming forward is the boundary change, so where your students will go to school. It has not changed since the 1970s. There have been tweaks here and there in various policies, but basically the boundary system has to change, and you were working on that, and, and Mr. Catania has asked or, and, and had the council pass that that be delayed a year because parents, guardians and others who are responsible for children are quite nervous about how you're going to change the path from elementary to schools to middle schools, junior high schools to high schools. I, I reached out to the um, parents of uh, Lafayette School in Northwest Washington because it, it straddles Ward 3 and Ward 4. I'm just going to I said, what should I ask the chancellor tonight about the boundary changes and nervous parents about have they bought in the wrong neighborhood? or should they, whatever. And so they just said, and they'll write them down easily. They're very quick questions. The families are worried about disrupting the path of students through the school system if they choose to stay in the system. Mm -hmm. They said, what is the process for the boundary changes that you're about to make? What are you doing to change those boundaries? What are you looking at? What is the schedule to start the process for the public and what will be the community feedback process so that people can have a say in what happens to the boundaries? Yeah, those are all good questions. Um, so the first thing that I want to say is part of the reasons why the boundaries have not changed since the 70s is because this is hard stuff, right? People buy their homes because um, they want to go to a particular school and any conversation around changing boundaries and feeders is like stepping on a third rail, right? Um, and because we have not made changes since the 70s, what we do is we make these kind of one-off changes, right? We'll say, oh, this school is kind of under-enrolled, right? So Deal, 70 years ago, was tremendously under-enrolled. And we said, well, we'll make all these schools feed to Deal to kind of build it up. Well, now, guess what? Bursting at the seams, right? And in fact, um, now parents are like, wait, don't, don't move me from Deal because I want to be in this feeder pattern. Um, all of that is legitimate. Um, the first thing that I want to say is, you know, we are clear that our existing students and families, we want to find ways for them to um, remain in, you know, whatever schools that they thought. So grandfathering or whatever is absolutely on the table. Our job, we, we, we're not going to rip your kid out of this school and send them to that school or whatever. Um, <clears throat> but um, these one-off decisions now have ripple effects all across the system. Um, so Wilson, for example, boundary is half of the city. And that, in fact, is impeding our ability to attract folks to the brand new Eastern, for example, or you know some of the other high schools. And so we, we are, um, I think, trying to be very, very careful in how we approach this work. Um, again, the mayor and the deputy mayor, we have some charter schools who said, I want to be part of the boundary and feeder pattern conversation. Um, and we think that's a good thing. And so, whereas DCPS was kind of going down this road by ourselves, um, we've kind of put the brakes on and we're working with the deputy mayor to figure out how we make this a real citywide process. Our intention is that we will convene um, a committee of folks, a large committee of folks, um, who will uh, work with the consultants who are looking at population trends and best practices and whatnot. There are experts who do this stuff and we're hiring them. Um, and so we'll have a large advisory group, um, but we will do community meetings, um, likely to start in the fall and go all through next year. Um, with the delayed start, um, you know, we don't have to make any real final decisions until the end of next year, which should then give people 
probably six months or so before um, they need to apply for the lottery for the following year. 2015 school year. Yeah, some way long time. Are, are there any white students in high school other than at Wilson and the Duke Ellington School? Yes. Where are they? Uh, there are a couple at McKinley. Um, in fact, you, you'd be shocked, right? At every graduation that I went to, I saw kids that you didn't think would be there. Um, and in fact, I feel like one of the interesting things is um, as our high schools are improving, Columbia Heights Education Campus, which people generally think is primarily Latino, um, it has a heavy Latino population, but it also has a huge, just broadly international population. Um, and there are white kids there too. In fact, there are white kids everywhere. <laughs> um, we do which I a, think is a good thing. We do have thing. a baby boom going on. You talked about how the schools are going to grow, and the mayor talks about maybe 150, 200,000 more people living in the city in the next 20 years. And yep. They will have schools. And, these, and young people that I've talked to, my son's age, in the 30, early 30s, say they do not want to buy a house in the suburbs and they don't want to afford private schools. They want the school system. Yeah, I mean, I think that. Um, part of the reason why many people want their kids in, um, in, in an urban school system is because diversity is such a huge strength. Um, we live in a world where we get to interact with lots of different kinds of people. And when our neighborhoods are segregated, then you only learn how to work and get along with one set of folks. That's not the world that we live in. And so many people are moving into the city because they want that mix. And I, you know, decoupling the housing segregation from the school segregation piece is really, I think, part of the boundary and feeder pattern work. Some, I actually find that um, some of, many of my friends are choosing charter schools not because they are outperforming DC public schools, but because there is an, an intentional creation of diversity, right? The, the, the nice thing about charter schools is they can not take children who are trouble. You have to take children regardless of who they are. We take everybody. Right, so that makes a big difference. Our charters, one of the proposals the mayor has is for you to, to create a charter school within a public school. Mm -hmm. Just briefly, how would that work? Because I've got a couple yep. of great questions here. Sure, so, um, you know, one of the things that I think we, one of the promises of the charter movement, there were kind of two promises, right? Give us increased autonomy and we will, you know, in exchange for increased accountability and we'll make some things happen. And um, the development of the charter sector will bring some pressure to bear on DC public schools to step up and compete, but we'll also be able to share best practices and learn from one another. And we don't pay attention to the share best practices and learn from one another. I feel like we over overemphasize the, the competitive nature of this. At the end of the day, I don't frankly care whether the school says charter or a traditional on the shingle. I just care about kids getting a great education. And so um, when we are able to look at some of the practices that high performing charters um, are able to undertake, which help them be successful, we want to be able to do that too. Um, I think we've learned that there are some freedoms and some autonomies that the charter sector has um, that hold us back, when in fact, if DCPS principals had some of those same freedoms, um, they'd be able to push student achievement um, at a much quicker pace. Is the union, uh, the Washington Teachers Union, a partner, an obstacle, or a competitor? Um, they've been a partner, frankly, um, for the time that I've been here. Um, Nathan has been really intent on, I think we all recognize that a happy workforce is a productive workforce. And um, there was a lot of healing that needed to be done, and I think that we were intentional about not continuing this public fighting. Um, I just feel like public fighting doesn't really get people places. Um, it's when you sit down and work together and collaborate that good things happen. And Nathan has been really um, cooperative. I want to get in, I, I don't think we have time to get into the common core curriculum, but that's kind of the latest, you know, is no child left behind, back to basics, you know, everybody turn around three times and dance. I mean, there have been all kinds of school reform efforts. But I want to, I have a couple of questions here. And this yeah, is I want a, to talk about the common the core. The top ones, oh, you do want to talk yes. about common core? Mm -hmm. Are we going to get the waiver? Uh, uh, the waiver of having to impose. We don't need the waiver. We know what we're talking about, common core, anybody? So let me. It's just between us. <laughs> let, let me get, ask that. Let me, well, can we get Common Core in a yes. moment? That sounds too tough for a TV mind. 
We have in the audience, a, uh, I hate DCPS. We have in the audience a District of Columbia school, high school graduate who has just graduated from college and hopes to teach math in a DC public school. Mm -hmm. uh, would that person want to identify himself or herself? Amen. You can't be sh okay. You can't be shy. You cannot be shy and be a teacher. You can see. What would you say? What would you say to her? Um, we would love to have you. Um, I, I think it's very, very important um, for our young people to feel like they can come back and give back um, in the places that helped to get you where you are. Um, I had a, a luncheon yesterday for valedictorians, salutatorians, most improved students, and scholar athletes. And you know, as we were trying to think about who we were going to have as guest speakers, we thought about celebrities and whatnot, and we decided that kids needed to see and touch um, successful DCPS alums. And so we had two great alums whose stories just blew us all away. They got great public educations in DC public schools. They are both doing amazing things. And when our young people see people who have come through DC public schools, who are from the same neighborhoods or who've attended the same schools, one, now reinvesting in them, that says something to them. Um, but it also shows them that they can take that path too and be successful. So come see me afterwards and we can talk about it for real. This is a polite person, he says, or she says, thank you for your time this evening. How do you take the challenge of being a leader of both the longtime veterans of the school system and also the newer alternate route educational professionals who are anxious to try new things? How do you marry those two? Um, so I think any, uh, you know, for the better part of 20 years now, I've been working on teacher recruitment and retention issues. And just like any workforce, right, you need some um, veteran folks, you need some middling career folks, and you need some new folks, right? It's, you need a mix of people in order to be successful. And I think it's fairly easy because everybody is trying to move student achievement, right? So um, we have a real common goal no matter how long you've been teaching. Um, I think we have an obligation to our veterans um, to help them understand some of the new things that we're trying to do because um, we're asking people to change some of the assumptions that they came into the profession with. Um, and what I find is when you sit down and talk to people, explain what you're trying to do and why, and then provide them with the support to help make the transition, everybody's kind of on board. So I don't, I don't see a dichotomy between leading younger teachers or newer teachers versus veterans teachers uh, middle schools get the short short end couldn't read that middle schools get the short end of the budget stick high schools this person says are an untenable choice but what does what needs to be done here in the middle schools to make certain that the young children we, uh, parents we talked about today whose children are just being born and getting into school stay for middle school yeah so the problem of my like the biggest problem of my job is there are like 25 things that all need to get done right this second right and we don't have the pocketbook or the capacity to do all of the things at the say at the same time um, and so we ultimately have to prioritize in fact um, when we first came in and 2007, um, we um, put an intervention into middle schools, which I think worked. It wasn't completely well executed, but um, we put what we call the full service schools model, um, which is a set of wraparound services. It's an assistant principal for intervention. So an assistant principal whose whole entire job is to figure out who are behavior issues, who have mental health issues, who have um, whatever kinds of issues, and then to connect those kids with the right services. We put in additional social workers and psychologists, behavioral techs, and all of these kinds of things. And um, in fact, for the first couple years, 2007, 8, uh, eight and nine and ten um, the only places that we were seeing movement on our test scores was in the middle school and we were like wow we haven't changed the curriculum we haven't whatever um, but we know that those wraparound services and and, and um, intentionality around interventions has actually helped our middle schools now um, with the standardized curriculum um, we now know what should be taught at elementary school level and, and who shouldn't leave if they have not mastered those skills um, this is a complete re-engineering of what's being taught so there are other things that we need to be doing at middle schools um, 
but we've invested heavily in elementary schools. We're continuing to invest in high schools. And if I get some more money, we'll be and, able to do some more stuff. And tighten up social promotions? Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. Um, what's the school system doing to comply with the Healthy Schools Act, specifically the requirement that there be 150 to 225 minutes a week of physical activity? Uh, what's the role of recess in public schools? That is a great question. Um, so you know, there's news today that there people want to make obesity, is, is call it a well, disease. disease. Yes, I saw that. Um, so we just met with the um, uh, the team that runs the, they don't call it the Presidential Physical Fitness thing anymore, but it's that group um, that's responsible for, for physical education and nutrition and health and wellness at the presidential level. And um, what they shared with us is, in fact, um, because we've revamped our health and PE standards, because we have undertaken pretty massive um, overhauls of our nutritional standards and what we're offering food, uh, what, what food we're offering to our young people, that in fact, when they look out across the country, we are doing much better um, than many school districts around health and physical education. Now, not where we need to be. In fact, um, we are guaranteeing more time in phys ed, but um, recess has been unstructured, and um, there's before school physical activity and after school physical activity that can happen. Um, they have a, a suite of services that they've asked. Um, uh, there's kind of five dimensions of the um, get active, let's move schools that the first lady has rolled out. We have a handful of schools who are doing that. We're gonna work with them over the next year to try to ensure that every single one of our schools is hitting all five of those dimensions. So not where we need to be, but on our way. I hate to ask this question because it sounds like an incredible bureaucratic answer, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it. The impact system is how the city judges and teach, uh, uh, judge, I think the word judge is not Evaluates. Right. Evaluates, I knew that was. How will the impact teacher evaluation system be adapted to accommodate the new and experimental tests that are likely to, to be developed as a result of the common core curriculum, which is the replacement for No Child Left Behind? That no, is, it's not. It, that, but, it's so not. you're correcting me? Well, because it's well, not. Will our children be used as guinea pigs as their teachers' jobs rely on how well they do on test developments? It's kind of a standard test question. Yep. So, um, Tell us what Common Core is. Yep. So, no child left not too long. No Child Left Behind is a, an accountability structure, right? The Common Core state standards are about what we are teaching our kids, not whether schools are failing or succeeding, not whether which groups are failing or succeeding. It is about a set of um, it's a, a, a set of standards which say if you reach them you are college and career ready in fact it's a set of standards which effectively says if you meet these you don't have to take remedial courses when you go to college so it's a huge shift because each state has been responsible for setting their own standards and so you know standards then state to state look like this it means that a high school diploma in one place um, is not worth a high school diploma in another place Federalism says that um, the U.S. Department of Education can't mandate that all states have the same standards, but um, they introduced the set of standards and asked states to sign on voluntarily. 46 states and a District of Columbia signed on to say we will adopt the Common Core standards, develop curriculum, and then take a standardized national exam in 2015 um, so that we see where our kids are and, and move forward that way. Um, because DCPS did not have a curriculum when we came in, um, we, you know, lots of other school districts are trying to figure out how they transition from their existing curriculum to the Common Core standards. Well, we didn't have anything, so we decided to go whole hog. Um, whereas most districts are kind of playing around with just K to two math or just ninth grade English, right? We have um, developed uh, curriculum and exams, frankly, from kindergarten through 12th grade, um, English language arts, social studies, science, the technical arts, and kindergarten through 12th grade math. Um, next year, we will roll out kindergarten through 12th grade writing standards across four different subject areas. And our goal in doing this was 
to begin to expose our young people to this much more rigorous content, to get our teachers understanding how they have to teach differently, and then to put the scaffoldings in place, right? Because literally, like, we weren't meeting this bar, and now the bar is higher, right? And lots of people are saying, well, you can't just move the bar. We're saying move the bar. We want our kids to, to compete, at, but we need to figure out then how to move them up quickly, how to make up the difference. And so we have been working. Um, Education Week, which is our industry newspaper, has done a four-part series on DCPS because we literally are the only district in the country that has gone this far on the Common Core Standards. For the last three weeks, we've been on the front page of Education Week and in a four-page spread. And the spread is not all, woohoo, it's so great. Like, it is about how hard it is to actually shift everything that you're doing. How hard it is when you have kids who are coming with all different um, ability levels, but it is recognizing that we are doing this work, that we're out in front. Um, the, the exams, so we actually worked with the state superintendent's office last year to change um, the English language arts DC CAS and align it to the Common Core. So last year, the test was harder. Nobody really paid attention. And in fact, for the first time, we saw a tick, small tick, but a tick up in our reading scores, which had been flat. Um, and I think in part it's because we're doing this deep work, this deep professional development with teachers. It's going to take a little while, but on the accountability side with impact, um, the thing about impact is it's not that we don't measure absolute test scores. You don't have to hit a certain thing. Um, the way the test score piece works, and I say piece because it is 35% of a teacher's overall um, of a teacher's overall evaluation, and only 15% of my teachers, 13% of my teachers actually are in tested grades and subject areas, so the vast majority of teachers are not even um, affected by this. But we look at growth, we look at growth. So we look at where kids were when they came in, we look at where kids were at the, uh, are at the end of the year, and we look at um, your kid's performance relative to other teachers who serve similar kids. So if we all bomb out, Right? Then guess what? Everybody's good, right? <laughs> it, there won't, it won't be like, well, everybody's going to get fired because we look at growth relatively, which we think is the fairest way um, for us to evaluate that um, for teachers. We're about out of time. Uh, um, the cheating scandal in Atlanta uh, ricocheted around the country with other places, and there was some of it here. Is that behind the system now? You have a, a more rigorous control over the standard test? Yeah, I mean, I think we have done, and if you ask sort of test uh, security experts, we are doing everything in the world that anybody knows how to do to um, prevent um, opportunities for cheating. Um, what in, is in, sad, in Atlanta, it was driven from the top down, which was yes. much different than sporadic cheating in this system. Or well, what? yeah, I mean, we have, uh, you know, when, when in 2007, 2008, when all of this stuff kind of started, um, the test integrity industry was very new. And school districts were charged with kind of policing themselves and figuring out, you know, if, I mean, we are educators, right? Nobody was a cheating expert. And so at the time, um, when most school districts were simply investigating themselves, we hired the people in the country who do this work, right? And there's been all kinds of, you know, brouhaha about whether or not the investigations were thorough or not. Um, I got to speak to the US Department of Education on a testing integrity um, summit. And effectively, until we all agree that this is what investigation should look like, that this is what the standardized flagging methodology should look like, then effectively we're all shooting in the dark, right? Everybody's doing something different. And what we need is some leadership um, from the feds to say, this is, this is how we're going to monitor. And then states who administer the test have the appropriate ability then to do the investigations and whatnot. What I am confident about is that um, in our current test administrations and whatnot, I feel like you know we are doing everything that we're supposed to do. What and I'm you'll sad be tough about, on cheaters. absolutely. I mean, okay. cheaters cheat kids. I, I don't want cheaters in my school district. Why? I mean, but I, I'm sad that because of you know the lack of clarity around 2008 or whatever, that our children and our our educators um, are really 
mm, maligned. Um, you know, we had this year, one of the, you know, more exciting ways to ensure test security is to not have the teacher who teaches you regularly administer the test, right? So you switch people on kids, right, during this very crazy time. And, you know, one kid said to me, Chancellor Henderson, I didn't cheat. How come my teacher can't be in the room with me? I don't want to end on that uh, tough note about cheating. I would ask you, do you still speak Spanish? Mm, not as well as I used to. Uh, <laughs> because the Latino population in the city is growing too. But the, yeah. the whole, it could be another whole hour talking about that and the diversity. But I think we're out of time. We had some great questions here. Some I didn't get to answer, ask, and I apologize for that. But let's uh, thank Kaya Henderson for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you.